Hello friend and welcome to my channel. Did you know that your eyes and inner ears team up to help you keep your balance? Your inner ears have special parts that can tell if your head is moving and give your eyes clues about what's around you. Together they help you walk, run, and do all kinds of activities without falling over. Did you know? When you catch a ball or type on a computer, your eyes and hands are working together like a team. Your eyes see where the ball is going or which keys to press, and your brain tells your hands how to move and catch the ball or type the right letters. It's kind of like a dance between your eyes and your hands. Did you know? Your heart and lungs work together to keep you alive by bringing oxygen to your body. Your heart pumps blood to your lungs, where it picks up oxygen and drops off carbon dioxide. Then your heart sends the oxygen-rich blood to all parts of your body so they can work properly and stay healthy. Did you know? Your stomach and blood work as a team to give you energy. When you eat food, your stomach breaks it down into tiny pieces and your intestines absorb all the good stuff. Then your blood carries these nutrients to all the cells in your body, like a little delivery truck dropping off packages, you know, better than Amazon. Did you know? Your brain and nerves help you to move, feel, and think. Your brain is like the boss making decisions and sending messages to your body through your nerves. And it's like your brain is the captain of a team and your nerves are the messengers delivering the game plan to all of the players. In this week's video, we're going to be diving into a powerful lesson from the book of 1 Corinthians. And did you know that just like we have different parts of our body, there are different members of the church that are meant to support and complement one another. So we're going to explore the parallels of the intricate workings of the human body and the unity and the diversity within the body of Christ. So grab your Bibles, your pens, your handy dandy notebooks. Let's go. It's time for us to get into this lesson. Hello to every one of you. Hello, TSSG family. Hello, TSSG family. You're in the TSSG space. Well, hello, TSSG family. Sunday, 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 Sunday school. Changing the way you see Sunday school with that Sunday school. Girl. Hello, TSSG family, and welcome to the UMI lesson review for Sunday. May 19th. My name is Wade Nell. You're in the TSSG space and here I share Christian content that is largely inspired by and or based on our Sunday school lessons. I do serve the UMI, Church of God in Christ, and international lesson communities and I am excited to be your reviewer for this week's lesson entitled, The Spirit Creates One Body. I pray that you've had a wonderful week. I have been getting in some airline miles this month for sure. So I've seen Memphis, Tennessee, Holly Springs, Mississippi, Washington, D.C and coming up soon i have kansas city south carolina and jackson mississippi so just pray for me as i'm moving and all of that i'm certainly praying for you that god is blessing you as you go and come if you are a first timer here i want to say welcome to you you have just joined an incredible community of believers we are students, teachers, pastors, Christian ed leaders, but most of all, we are people who love God and we love his word. So we get into this word together. We're studying, we are growing, and we're learning how to apply the word of God. So whether you are any one of those people, or if you are honest and you're like, hey, way now, I'm not quite in Sunday school yet, but I do need a good Bible study. You have found your tribe. So everyone do me a favor, look down below, make sure that you click the subscribe button. Everyone, even if you're not a newbie, click that subscribe button. Also click the notifications bell. I don't want you to miss any content when it's uploaded on this channel. And then do one more thing for me. I need you to make sure if you're watching this video that you take a moment to click that thumbs up like button. It doesn't cost you a thing, but it encourages us and it also lets YouTube know the kind of content that you enjoy which is what curates your experience on YouTube listen I want to take a moment to do something that you know I I, I can't miss this moment I've missed it already twice I don't know I just I think I'm always in the zone and trying to get lessons out but I haven't paused to say thank you thank you so very much for nine amazing years in the TSSG space. May the 1st made nine years for this ministry and I am so honored. I thank you for allowing uh, me to serve you in this space of digital evangelism before there was a pandemic 
we were doing Sunday school here on YouTube and I am so appreciative that you choose week after week to renew your relationship uh, with this channel and to share with me. So uh, I've made friends through the years on this channel. I've received so much encouragement and I want to say thank you again for allowing me to serve you. Uh, when people have birthdays or when holidays come up, I notice that people will put their gift list out there. So I am going to do that today. I'm going to ask you for two things. There are two things on my wish list for anniversary month. The first thing is that I wish you would please invite someone to subscribe to this channel. I don't mean just tell them about the channel. I mean where you see them take out their phone. I want you to see them take out their phone, take them to the channel and watch them press that subscribe button. I did it last week with my YouTube driver. It was a wonderful moment of just sharing and ministry. And she says, well, what's the name of your channel? And I watched her subscribe to the channel. It happened as well when I was on the cruise. People that didn't even look like me subscribe to this channel. So please, coworkers, church members, have them subscribe to this channel. The second thing that I am going to ask you for, and I certainly don't do this much, is for your gift in a tangible way. I'm going to ask you, and I'm gonna ask again next week, for you to share a gift of $9 with this ministry. That's a dollar a year. If we've added value in any way, a uh, dollar per year is what we've asked for you to share with us. And it, it may surprise you, this ministry is run uh, largely on the kindness of others, but there are about 12 people who share regularly each week uh, in any way with this channel. So I appreciate what you do. I appreciate your consideration of $9. And the goal is for us to upgrade the ways that we're serving you today. So that's always, uh, we look at May for our equipment upgrades and things like that. So that's what your gift is going to help us do. Uh, I am not full-time ministry, so I do depend on your kindness. So would you share that gift of $9? And I want to say again, thank you for receiving me in this space of digital evangelism. And here is to our next year together. Let's prepare to go into our lesson, uh, we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through 31. We have a lot of reading today. Um, our memory verse is going to be verse 20. And our lesson aims that we, we will analyze how each member of the body supports the other members, value the different gifts operating within the church, and decide um, which spiritual gifts and operations with others. Decide, something is not right here. Let me just... I'm going to take this as a blooper moment and not start over. Let me look at my commentary and read this correctly to you. Don't you love when live bloopers happen? Mm -hmm. Real people. This is a real channel. All right. Uh, let's see here. We are going to decide to use, that's what I misspelled, to use spiritual gifts and operations with others for the building up of the body of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity to be together once again in community. Thank you for um, a supportive community in which we do life together. Thank you that as we are navigating life, that part of this means that we are required to learn to work together and we learn to work together so that we bring uh, the uniquenesses that you have put in each, each one of us into a space where we have synergy and we are so much better together than we are as individuals. So thank you that you are helping us to discover our gifts. Thank you that you're learning, helping us to learn how to work in community. But most of all, I thank you for the exponential growth that happens when we are humble enough to submit ourselves and our gifts into spaces where we can be better together. I pray that you'll open up our minds, our hearts, our understanding, and never um, allow us to take your word for granted. Help us to have an opportunity to use this word in a very real way. Thank you for discipling us and making us better through your word. We love you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go here. And we will begin our reading at verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. It is therefore, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has set every member, set the members, every one of them in the body as it had pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? 
But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think less honorable, upon these we bestow abundant honor, more abundant honor. And our more uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness and our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and God hath set some in, in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workings of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. This is our reading for this week. Again, as we explore this lesson, the spirit creates one body. We are inside of our UMI Bible in an entire year series. In the New Testament, we now move to the book of First Corinthians. Let's do what we always do, and let's take a look at our background. Um, I find that background is helpful because it not only gives us the context for what is going on, but Recently, I think I've been, been looking for ways to be more relatable to the people in the text. I think especially when we look at the Pauline epistles, it's easy to talk and look at, you know, Paul's instruction. But I like to look at the issues of the people and why these messages were actually necessary. So 1 Corinthians is the seventh book of the New Testament. And it is a pastoral letter. Our book type is a letter that is written to express um answers to the specific issues within the church at Corinth. And it also gives us these timeless principles by which we can learn to live and operate in our faith communities. Uh, I love church. I'm a church kid born and bred, but churches are organizations. And in organizations, you're going to always have to deal with people. And the people factor means learning to deal with the different personality types. And so that's what Corinth is dealing with here. We've got Paul, who is our author. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. This letter was likely written around 55 or 56 um, AD. He writes this letter while he is in Ephesus during his third missionary journey. And he stays in Ephesus for an extended period of time, maybe around three years. And so his purpose of writing this letter, and he writes two letters to the church of Corinth, but this first letter is about addressing several issues and challenges that are facing the Corinthian church. And these challenges are really about divisions and factions within the church. It's about moral misconduct and lawsuits among believers and questions about marriage and celibacy and abuses of spiritual gifts and theological misunderstandings. And particularly, there is a misunderstanding of resurrection from the dead. So the city of Corinth, the people live in sort of a bustling metropolis. It's the hub of ancient Greece, and it's known for its commerce, diverse population, prosperity, culture, and moral laxity. Now, I always say this, whenever you have people who uh, come from a lot of diverse backgrounds, that comes with a lot of different understandings and ways that they've experienced the world. And Paul is now trying to align what is common about them, and that is their faith, their space as Christians. You may come from a lot of different backgrounds. You may have had a lot of different experiences, but what he's aligning now is what they understand about their faith. Um, as a community, the Corinthians were known for their pursuit of wealth, status, and pleasure, and their environment, their atmosphere was really permissive. Um, it was rampant with immorality and idolatry and social inequality, and so the cultural backdrop is what really like highlights these challenges that are faced by the Corinthian church. So 
Paul now is writing and in this letter, he's going to address several major themes. And here are major themes. They are unity and division. We're going to talk about that today. Church discipline, spiritual gifts, the resurrection, Christian living, the Lord's Supper and worship and love and charity. So we're in chapter 12 and I want to look like specifically at what's going on that leads up to this part of his letter. So in the preceding chapters, Paul has been addressing these various issues that I just talked about inside the church. They don't just have one issue. They are a church with many issues. And I just want to pause right there because sometimes churches have issues. Please don't think it's strange if your church ever has to sort through an issue. I will say again, whenever you get together, any group of people, you are going to have to tackle some tough things, whether it's tough topics, you know, rubs between people, misconduct that happens, just general misunderstandings. It is going to happen. And so Paul has dealt with some of those things. And now in chapter 12, he's going to shift to this conversation of spiritual gifts. Uh, the word for is where our lesson begins. And that word is a connector. You see the word for that means it's building on something that's happened before. So Paul has been laying out an argument and that's what he's going to continue here is this argument of what he's already laid out around unity and diversity within the body of Christ. It is possible to have unity even where there's difference. Where in fact, all of us present with some level of difference, where we're from, what we've experienced, what our families are like, and yet unity is possible. But the Corinthians issue is that they were struggling with pride. And that's what led to the division regarding the spiritual gifts. They were placing like undue emphasis on certain spiritual gifts. And so those gifts were the ones that were more visible and more flashy. We're not going to talk about the Corinthians too badly for a moment because in our churches today, we do put more emphasis on certain gifts. We look at those quite often who have more visibility, uh, those who have the microphone more often, those who stand behind a, a sacred desk, a being in the pulpit, whatever that may be, we do tend to put more emphasis on those more flashy things. Uh, the Corinthians also put more emphasis on things like speaking in tongues uh, while they were devaluing gifts like serving and helping. And so this really led to this sense of superiority among those who had certain gifts and inferiority to those who didn't possess those gifts. Whenever you're dealing with those feelings, superiority and inferiority, then you can just about wait for the feelings of jealousy to surface inside of a community. And that's what was happening here. He's also dealing with the confusion and the disorder over the exercise of spiritual gifts during their gatherings. And so you've got some people there who are speaking in tongues without an interpreter. They're speaking in tongues over each other. You know, my tongues are better than your tongues. Again, tongues were for edification. And this lesson this week is not about speaking in tongues, but please know that tongues are for the edification of the body of Christ and not for chaos to be created in the body of Christ. And so whenever gifts are misunderstood or whenever gifts are misused, they actually hinder the unity of the body of Christ and they actually diminish the effectiveness of the church in fulfilling its mission. And so when Paul writes this letter, it is all about getting people back on the right track because at the end of the day, and this is something that I hope you'll take away um, as you study that no matter you know what's going on in your church, and let's just be honest, sometimes you'll have people for whatever reason, they don't get along. When we make those the bigger issues, who I don't like and what they wear and they think they're better and she's always doing this, when we run up on those issues, we decrease the effectiveness of the overall mission in church. And I can tell you this, um, I understand and I've seen that in church where gifts and things about people were misunderstood or um, coveted by another person. I can be, remember being a child and, and, and another adult stood up in church and says, you know, whatever she was talking about, she eventually shifted to. And I don't just want to see Waynell doing things. I want to see my daughter doing X and I want to see my... I was like, whoa, like I'm a kid in this space. But that again comes from a place within where we don't recognize our own gifts and where we don't value what we bring into a space. And so those kind of feelings start to stir up. And so Paul is now laying out this argument that does talk about the diversity of spiritual gifts 
and how they function in the church. And we are looking at this analogy of the human body to look at the points that he's making that everybody is necessary in the body, that despite their differences, he wants Corinth to know that they are all a part of the same body. They are all unified by the same spirit. And so verse 14 begins where Paul wants Corinth to know that every member of the body of Christ is valuable and necessary for it to function in a way that is healthy. I love the fact that when God designed the church, the workings of the church, he understood that this is not a one man show because nobody can do everything. If you try to do everything, you will burn yourself out. Um, I actually struggle with people who say that they operate in all ministries. They have all the spiritual gifts. No, you don't. If you had all the spiritual gifts, you wouldn't sleep at night. If you operate in every gift function in the church, you wouldn't find rest. And so God has made a way such that everyone has something that they can give and they can contribute. I love something that uh, my bishop, Bishop Thuston says, and he says that God gave everybody something but he did not give everyone everything. And so that's what Paul wants people to understand that everyone has something as a member of the body of Christ. And what we've got to do is learn to embrace those things that are different about others and to avoid comparing ourselves to them and recognize that we have a need for each other. We are guilty of overlooking certain contributions in the church. I remember, uh, this was actually before the pandemic, there was one particular night um, at a Wednesday night Bible study that our pastor and his family were traveling. And at the time, his son, a young man, was largely over our sound. And let me be honest with you, I was the Bible study teacher that night and I knew how to unlock the doors of the church. I knew how to turn the alarms off. I knew how to turn the lights on. Um, but I didn't know how to turn the microphones on. I went back and looked at the board with all of its little widgets and gadgets and, and oh no, I did not know how to turn that on. So in that moment, what seemed so small, you know, we take for granted the sound system on a Sunday morning when we have the sound of worship going on and you know, everything that's going, but I didn't know how to do that. So that's his gift. His gift is about supporting what it takes to actually make the service happen. And so all of us have to work to avoid Avoid, you know, that comparison, know that we are connected and approach other people with humility and respect for the gift that they bring. And so Paul starts by using this analogy of the body to explain spiritual gifts in the church, just like the human body has many parts. It has many functions. The body of Christ has many members and those members all have different roles. And he even addresses that some members will look at others and devalue your own gift. You know, that's a, that's inside of you. When you feel inferior, that's a thing that you may need to look at inside of you. Why are you allowing yourself to feel inferior or less significant because you don't have the same gift as another person? Paul lets us know that every person is essential to the body of Christ, regardless of their perceived importance. Um, there is a woman that I love so much. She's gone to be with the Lord and she was a musician. That was a beautiful gift. But one of our most beautiful gifts, Mother Johnson, the late Mother Johnson was sitting in her home and handwriting cards and letters to the saints to encourage people. So the gift may have seemed small, but so impactful that she could encourage someone. And so Paul kind of uses these hypotheticals and they're really absurd, right? To compare certain body parts to the other. You know, he's like, so, you know, if the ear says I'm not an ear, um, that if the ear says that I'm not an eye, I don't want to be part of the body. Like, is that a thing? And the words that he uses are absolutely, they're absurd, but he's trying to shake people to say, you need to understand that these parts, they matter. So you can't just say, I'm going to separate. I don't want to do. No, we're all a part of the body together. So we've got to learn to embrace this diversity, avoid comparison, value that we are connected and learn to serve humbly together. So embracing this equality, Paul is now, you know, talked about the importance of the members of the body of Christ our mutual dependence on each other, 
And just how God has so beautifully arranged each member, like we've got to embrace that diversity, knowing that God has created you to serve in a space, in a way, in a place that nobody else can do it just like you do it. I talk about my uh, mother often and um, very rarely, very rarely will you get my mother up in front of a group of people to talk. And that may surprise you, right? Because I'm a talker, my sister's a talker, my brother's a pastor, he's a talker, but that's just not her thing. But what you cannot beat my mother doing is serving, the gift of helps. You cannot beat her at, for example, the pastoral anniversary or any um, any of the banquets that we've had or certain dinners. My mother is an amazing cook. She has an eye for decoration, the place, her ability to make a space beautiful, to transform it into something beautiful cannot be beat. So that's what I'm talking about when I talk about looking at how we can, in the middle of the things that are different, we can know that there is something that everybody brings to make the total beautiful. That's the idea of synergy, right? It is that that the sum, that together, we are better together than each one of us with our thing individually. So we've got to reject this idea that we are exclusive and superior inside of the body of Christ. And that's what Paul is arguing here, that we've got to um, guard against dismissing or devaluing members based on what we think is important about their contribution. And in doing so, we learn to honor diversity. Paul in verses 23, uh, 22 through 24, really challenges the Corinthians to reevaluate their perception of certain members within the body of Christ. He's telling them that their true value and significance is not about social standards. It's not. It is really when you create a culture that honors people, a culture that celebrates gifts, and a culture that really creates a space where people feel cared for. Like that's a value in our church community. And part of that feeling cared for or care in the church community is acceptance. That what you bring, we are willing to accept that and find a space that you're able to contribute. So, you know, we've got to challenge those ideas just like Paul does with the Corinthians, that certain members are weaker because they don't do what you do, that they are less honorable because they don't serve in the ways that you seem. But knowing that every member of the body is actually indispensable. There is like, you know, I was reading something this week and I think it was a comic strip. And it was like, you know, what part of the body would you not want to be in the person? It was like, I wouldn't want to be the appendix because that's the thing that you can live without. You know, I don't want to. I realize you can. I still have mine. Thank God. But there is no part of my body that I want to live without. I can't think of anything on my body that I would say I'm willing to give up. Ah, oh, you know. I think I don't want my pinky toe. Nope, yes I do, because I value my balance. Oh, I think I can do without my thumb. Nope, because I want to be able to pick up things, right? And it also, a couple of weeks ago, um, I stubbed my pinky toe on the edge of a bed. And oh, oh, it hurt, it hurt. And I talked just like I'm talking right now. And I said, oh, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. Oh, oh, oh. But the thing is, I didn't let any ugly words come out of my mouth. But what they told me was how the smallest part of your body can cause a whole lot of pain. It's there. I got to pay attention to the pinky toe. I don't want to beat up and abuse the pinky toe because it was a lot of pain, but every part of your body is a part that is needed. And so, you know, Paul is talking about its value. He's talking about significance and really, again, creating a space of honor, which is really countercultural because society and culture wants us to have really a lot of hierarchy and inside of hierarchy is a space where we will ignore and devalue and not recognize the contribution of every individual. So he's emphasizing each other, this unity, care, empathy. He's calling for all believers to really stand in solidarity with each other, to share in each other's experience. Verse 25, there's not supposed to be this kind of schism. There's not supposed to be division in the body. We're supposed to have care one for another. When you choose a community of faith, you want to know that we care for one another. And I often find that people come into the community looking for what they can get 
But do you think about the quality of person that you are and what you give in that space? Do you care for others? Or are you, are you only looking to be cared for? It is a mutual thing where we work to make sure that I am not contributing to division. I don't want to be a part of division. And I want to make sure that I am being a part of caring for one another, stating that uh, Paul states that basically when one member suffers, then we all suffer. When somebody is rejoicing over something, we're all happy. I love in my local church, the culture of our church, what we hear from leadership, from our pulpit is we do life together. And when things happen, when an announcement is made, you know, someone has had surgery, someone has lost a loved one. The language is this. And you know what we do. Let's respond in the way that community responds. There is an expectation of care that should happen in a culture where unity exists. There should be empathy. There should be a communal response when there is a need. We celebrate together. We cry together. And we acknowledge that everyone has a role to play. I'll say again, ministry is not a one-man show. It's not. And as a leader, I will definitely tell you it's a space that I have to work at, I have to grow um, continually, not because I want to do everything, but um, oftentimes I know that I'm looking for someone who has the same heart or same spirit or same passion, but what I have to guard against is doing everything myself, right? And so I think some of you as leaders can identify with that. We're not meant to do everything on our own. Even in TSSG, there are some changes that have been made. I'm grateful for a team of people that work around me and with me because I cannot do it all by myself. And so Paul is identifying in verses 27 and 28 that believers have to understand that there are lots of roles in this body of Christ. He's still in this metaphor of the body, but collectively we have a function that is called the body of Christ. And he introduces these idea of spiritual gifts and their distribution. Again, spiritual gifts are distributed in the body of Christ. They are not concentrated where one individual has all of the gifts. And so these gifts include apostleship, prophecy, teaching, miracles, healing, assistance, administration, and speaking in tongues. If you download the TSSG notes, and I'm sorry, they're in the description box down below. I have a chart in here that explains what each one of these functions are. And these spiritual gifts, apostles are chosen to spread the message of Christianity and to establish churches. Prophets speak messages from God. These are just headlines. Teachers are responsible for instructing believers in the teachings of Christ. We disciple others. I'm grateful to be a teacher. If you're a teacher, Drop, I'm a teacher in the chat box. As a matter of fact, whatever your gift is, I invite you to share that in the chat box. What is your gift? There's miracles, individuals who are gifted with the ability to perform, perform miracles, the gifts of healing, certain individuals who can heal the sick through prayer or laying on of hands. Helping, like my mom, the role of those who assist and support others in the church community. Administration, some who have the gift of leadership and administration and various kinds of tongues. Um, I think it is very maturing when you understand the spaces that God has called you to operate. I know without question that God has called me as a teacher, and I know without question that he has given me the gift of administration. And so when you think about that, I want you, if you don't know your gifts, to be prayerful uh, but I think that even spiritual gifts, discovering them, there are spiritual gifts assessments, of course. But I even think looking at how you operate in your daily life, there's something about the way that you move very practically. That's an indicator about how God can use you in spiritual gifts. And so with these spiritual gifts, it's like having a toolbox for all of the different jobs. God gives believers these gifts to do their part. And doing your part is about doing what it takes to build a strong and loving community. Your gift is about contributing to a strong and loving community. It's not so that others are jealous or wanna be like you, but it is about knowing how the specific tasks that you perform are needed in the church and help the church, help people grow closer to God and help the church to fulfill its purpose. Finally, there is this question that Paul asks as he's looking at this diversity of gifts. Is everybody a prophet? Is everybody an apostle? 
Is everybody a teacher? These are rhetorical questions because the answer is no. Everyone is not going to have all of these gifts. Again, even Paul says that it's just about impossible for everyone to have, you know, all the same gift within a body. If everybody in your congregation has the same gift, you are not fulfilling mission. You're not fulfilling purpose. It's impossible. It's impossible. So he encourages the believers to earnestly desire the higher gifts, meaning gifts that are valuable in the ways that God wants to use you, recognizing the importance that difference brings into a space and desiring the gifts uh, that you can serve better in the kingdom of God. This lesson was beautiful for me. Again, looking at the complexity of like the body, the human body, and comparing it to just how complex we are as the body of Christ, looking at this analogy, um, I can't help, and I've reflected a little bit on my own experience and my community of believers, uh, reflecting on the community in my church here in Texas, and even the community of believers that I get to share with in this space. I'm so blessed for people who share their gifts with me in this space, and I'm reminded of how beautiful diversity is, that we all bring something different, but how God uses those things. You are fearfully you're wonderfully made. So if you're one of my friends who who's ever struggled uh, because number one, you may not know your gift or maybe you have a gift and you have devalued your gift. You think it's not as wonderful. I'm going to challenge you this week to spend some time and think about what has God given you and what makes it beautiful? What has God given you? And we would not be the same if you didn't have that gift. You know, shout out to Sister Sabrina at my church. Nobody can clean a building like Sister Sabrina. And if Sister Sabrina, oh, she had surgery, I think, last year on her wrist and she was out for a few months. Woo! All I can tell you is it was not a pigsty, but I was very clear. It did not have the same sparkle that it has when Sister Sabrina cleans. And so whatever your thing is, you might be someone who has a gift for baking or for cooking. Whatever your thing is, look at how God can bring uh, glory to the communal space through what he's given you. My word of the week, they're words this week. They're words again, I'm sorry, but my words are one body, one body. Here are my learnings this week. My O is for one body, many parts. I've learned that just as the body has many parts with different functions, so too does the body of Christ have diverse members, each one with unique gifts and roles. My N is for no division, only care. I understand the importance of unity within the body of Christ where there is no room for division, only mutual care and support among its members. My E is for every member is valued. I've come to recognize that every member of the body, regardless of their perceived importance, is valued and indispensable to the functioning of the whole. My B is for bestowing honor equally. I've been reminded of the need to bestow honor equally on all members of the body, regardless of societal norms or distinctions, as God has intentionally composed the body in this way. My O is for only one body in Christ. I realize that we are all parts of the same body in Christ with a shared identity and mission, despite our diverse gifts and roles within the community. My D is for desiring higher gifts. I'm encouraged to earnestly desire the higher gifts and to use my own gifts faithfully for the building up of the body of Christ, guided by love. And finally, my why is for yielding to unity. And I've been inspired to yield to the unity of the body of Christ. And I recognize that our collective strength lies in our interconnectedness and our operation as one body. I've given you a three-day challenge this week, as well as my personal prayer on the TSSG notes. And I do pray that there's been something helpful in this lesson that will bless you as you continue your faith journey and something that will help you in your understanding of this lesson. I invite you to leave any comments down below. I love reading them and adding into my own. I love you all so much. Thank you so much again for nine amazing years. I'll see you in Sunday school. Bye everybody. Thank you so much for sharing in this space with us today. If this ministry has blessed you in any way, I invite you to consider sharing a small gift of just $3 with us. You can do so by scanning one of the QR codes on the screen. And please don't forget, we are waiting for you to join us over in the TSSG Connect. You can see all the benefits here on the screen, and we look forward to serving you in a more personal way. Have you had an opportunity to visit our amazing swag shop? Stop by and check out great items for Sunday school and church school. T-shirts, pouches, mugs, and so much more. Find something that you'll enjoy or something for your favorite teacher.
with fast on the way to school. 